Ozark Highlands Radio is brought to you by the Ozark Folk Center State Park in Mountain View, Arkansas. A wonderful way to enjoy yesterday. On the web at ozarkfolkcenter.com. And by Stone Bank, a community bank supporting entrepreneurs and farmers nationwide with loans guaranteed by the USDA, SBA, and Farm Services Agency. Learn more at stonebank.com. And the Arkansas Arts Council, empowering the arts for the benefit of all Arkansans. On the web at arkansasarts.org. And by the Committee of 100 for the Ozark Folk Center, preserving Ozark folk culture since 1974 through music roots, craft apprenticeships, and the Heritage Herb Garden. Learn more at ofc100.org. Howdy, folks. This is Dave Smith, host of Ozark Highlands Radio. Welcome to our show. This week, I'll be teaming up with my friend and former Arkansas State old-time fiddle champion, Emily Lawless, to listen to and discuss one of the most interesting fellows we know, Banjo Billy Matthews. Our producer, Jeff Glover, has found an archival recording of Ozark original Larry Poff. And in his segment, Back in the Hills, Dr. Brooks Blevins examines the gradual disappearance of traditional Ozarkian language in the modern Ozark region. All that this week on Ozark Highlands Radio. I'm here in the Ozark Highlands Radio studio today uh, being visited by a great friend of mine, Emily Lawless, a terrific fiddle player and just a wonderful person, and who, by the way, uh, first learned to play the fiddle as part of the Music Roots program that we have here in Stone County, Arkansas, where we go into the schools and teach, uh, beginning with fourth graders, teach them to play traditional instruments. And it sure worked well with Emily because she went on to be an Arkansas State fiddle champion. Hey, Emily. Hey, Dave. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to see you. Yeah, glad to be here. So we are here today because we got hold of a bunch of recordings of our old friend Billy Matthews, Banjo Billy. And I know that you know him very well because you are the person who transcribed 500 of his songs into a wonderful book of American old-time fiddle songs that came right out of Billy Matthews' head. He remembers a few tunes, doesn't he? Yeah, one or two here and there. Well, uh, let's just kick right off here by listening to one of his tunes. This is one we've got called the Jack Frost Two-Step. Thank you, thank you. Now let's see, what it got, now we got a tune that comes from way south, way down in where, Texas. And uh, this tune is called The Texas Grasshopper. But anyway, it's a good tune, so we're gonna play it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Billy Matthews playing the Jack Frost two-step and a tune called the Texas Grasshopper. Emily, who do you, who do you think was backing him up on that tune? That was Christine and Paul Breen. Christine on banjo and Paul on guitar. Oh, they're from southern Illinois, aren't they? That's correct. Yeah, and they spend a lot of time with Billy. They're his main backup crew. Absolutely. They went through the whole 500 with us and, and heard every single one and, and played along sometimes. Tell us a little bit about how this 500 thing happened. Yeah, so I started learning from Billy when I was nine years old, and I learned a lot of tunes from him. And we would sit, you know, in the living room of this inn, and he would teach workshops in this, you know, historical bed and breakfast. And I learned all of these tunes, and he decided to make CDs and record all 500 of these tunes. So when I went to college, I was looking at these 500 and thinking, you know, how can I contribute in some way and make this something that, you know, even more people can use? And so a lot of people were needing to write these down in order to help remember the tunes or help learn it if they weren't confident learning by ear. So I asked Billy what he would think about turning it into a book. Um, and he thought it was a great idea. And yeah, it just went from there. And it came out great. I have that book and I use it all the time, haul it out and learn some tunes from it. Glad to hear it. Let's listen to another tune of Billy's. Uh, this one is called Burt Anderson, and it's a tune I'm not familiar with. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, Billy got this tune from Barbara Weathers up in St. Louis. And, uh, and I learned it from Billy sitting here in Mountain View. Okay, here it is. It's called, what? Bert Anderson. He must have been somebody. They made a tune up uh, after him, so. Bert Anderson. <laughs> Okay, let's see if we're gonna, oh yeah. Okay, what did we do when we changed? Oh, here now we got another one. I don't, this one might have, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this one before. It's um, an unusual tune, but they all are, actually. This is called <laughs> the Coach Whip Polka. Yeah, it's unusual. <laughs>
Two more great tunes from Banjo Billy Matthews. Uh, We heard Burt Anderson and another tune called the Coach Whip Polka. I want to mention a little bit about how Banjo Billy got here. He Billy moved here from Northwest Colorado in 1975, I believe, at the age of 22 years old. Uh, he was actually uh, a part of the Back to the Land movement, which I was as well. A lot of people moved to the country back around that time to try to carve out a place in the wilderness, and that's exactly what he did. He bought an old farm up near Osage, Arkansas, and uh, built a house and raised a family, and all that time learned fiddle tunes, didn't he? Why don't you introduce the next one? This next tune is going to be Gonna Get My Mustache Blacked When I Get There. I love the name of that. It's a good tune. And this is one of the very rare tunes that Billy actually learned on the internet. Really? Yes. Maybe 99% of his tunes he learned in person, face-to-face with someone, and this is one of the ones he just liked the recording. All right, let's hear it. Yeah, this is a tune. Not sure where it comes from. You can't be sure of where they all come from, but they gotta come from somewhere. This one's called... Uh, gonna get my mustache blacked when I get there. <laughs> so the old guy must be turning gray or something. He wants to spiff up and get his mustache blacked again. Okay, here it goes. Ready? Mm. <laughs> just kind of rides along all by itself. Out of the book. Yes, out there. The, there's a book out there that Emily, Emily uh, Wallace and, he, and I made of 501 fiddle tunes that I've collected all over the place. And anyway, I'm, I'm working on, I've done the 600 now, so I'm going on to 700. And so we're planning ahead uh, on the way to 1,000 and one. You got to have that, you know, you got to have that one extra. And so that's what I'm working on for the rest of my life. But at least I got something to do. You've got purpose in your day. There's reason to get up. Let's learn another tune. And anyway, this one is called the Golden Silver Two-Step. And this is another one that, yeah, you betcha, it's from up north there, eh? And uh, that's what they say up there. Um... There you go, it's the two-step. That's it. Yeah. Um.
More great tunes from uh, Banjo Billy Matthews. What was that second tune after going to get my mustache blacked when I get there? That was the gold and silver two-step. Aha. Uh-huh. Hey, it's time for us to take a short break. And when we come back in about a minute, we'll hear from our producer, Jeff Glover, who's been spending some time down in the vault lately. This is Ozark Highlands Radio. Welcome back to Ozark Highlands Radio. You know, I saw our producer, Jeff Glover, go down into the vault about two hours ago, and he's been down there all this time. Uh, Let's go down and see what he's doing down there. Jeff! Hey, Dave! Hey! (laughs) I I hardly recognize you over here in the corner. It's dingy down here. Uh, You know, Mark never got any light bulbs for this place. (laughs) Is that what it was? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, I was listening to some old Kingston Trio recordings the other day. And I heard a song that's just a great old song. I, I think it became popular in the folk scare of the 1960s uh, called 900 Miles. And I wonder if it, you've got any recordings down here of that song. Oh, gosh. I'm sure there are. There's probably thousands of them. Let me see. <laughs> you know, I remember a while. Ah, here we go. This is a good one, actually. I listened to this recently. Uh, it's by a guy named Larry Poff. Do you remember anybody named Larry? You know, I don't. It may have been a little bit before I came on board. Well, the guy's got a great voice, and he does a great rendition of 900 Miles. Would you like to hear it? I'd love to. <laughs> Walking down the track, I got tears in my eyes. Trying to read a letter from my home. If this train runs me right, I'll be home Saturday night. I'm 900 miles away from home. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. Oh, this train that I ride on is a hundred coaches long. You can hear the whistle blow for miles and miles If this train runs me right, I'll be home Saturday night I'm 900 miles away from home And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow Oh, I'm going upon my watch and I'm going upon to my chain And I'm going upon my golden diamond ring If this train runs me right I'll be home Saturday night I'm 900 miles away from home And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow my love bids me stay I will never go away it's nearer to her I'll always be if this train runs me right I'll be home Saturday night I'm 900 miles away from home and I hate to hear the lonesome whistle blow and I hate to hear the lonesome whistle Walking down the track, I've got tears in my eyes Trying to read a letter from my home 
If this train runs me right, I'll be home Saturday night. I'm 900 miles away from home. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. That guy's got a fine voice, doesn't he? He really does. He sounds great. Yeah, that, I love that kind of singing style. That song is actually quite an old song. I believe it was uh, first recorded in 1924, and it's probably a lot older than that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a traditional song. I don't yeah, know. yeah it's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know where it came from, but uh, yeah, it's been recorded. I don't know how many times, but all kinds of Woody Guthrie. You did a version of it. And, yeah, Peter Paul and Mary did it. Oh yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, and and Larry Larry Poff, whoever he is, does a great job singing. That's it, right. Yeah. Well, that's a true folk song. That's for sure. For sure. For all sure. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll see you next time I'm down here. I guess. Yeah, you bet, Dave. All it's right. my pleasure. All right. As you know, we're featuring banjo Billy Matthews here, and I'm here in the studio with. My good friend Emily Lawless, who knows an awful lot about Billy's music that he's played over the years. You know, Emily, I was thinking about it, 500 tunes that he has recorded, and they came right out of his head. None of that was written down. It's just tunes that he remembers. Yeah, just, just knows them by memory. That's incredible. It's a lot of tunes. Uh, I don't know about you. My fiddle tune list maybe has about 200 tunes on it, and that's everything I've learned in my life. 500 is a lot, and that's nothing, is it? He, there's more to it than that, I suppose. We still don't know the full list. We're up to 600 so far. What do you think it's going to come out to? Oh, man, I, I think he's aiming for 1,000. I wouldn't be surprised if he makes it to 1,000, too. What do we got to listen to now? We're going to hear the South Callaway Waltz and the Old Sea Waltz. Billy's of the opinion people don't play enough waltzes, so he likes to play plenty of them. Oh, now, here's a Missouri tune. Isn't this a Missouri tune? This is another waltz, the South Callaway Waltz, and South Callaway is a county region in Missouri that's called Little Dixie. That's around Jefferson City up there. So this, oh, South Callaway Waltz. Are you ready? Uh, let's see. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Whew. Um, I started coming here to the Folk Center when it was a new place. 
That was, uh, I think it was new in 74. I came in 76. And I'm not going to count how many years ago that really is, but it doesn't matter. It's way back there. And I'm still here. Um, thank you very much. Well, I first came here, and the beginning of the, uh, the Ozark Foothills Craft Guild was going on the first time that I came. And uh, that goes way back. And I sold the banjo to somebody here in Mountain View. And that's what I did for a living, uh, was make banjos. And that was so I could feed the children. And it worked, by golly. I grew them up, and then, and then they had children. Now I have six grandchildren. And uh, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough for anybody. But I, I, you know, I don't see them all at once. And that's a kindness. <laughs> so this tune, let's see. This one I got from an old Norwegian guy. Um, and I met him in Yankton, South Dakota. But on his recording that he gave me way back 30 years ago, he comes on and says, this next tune is the old C waltz, you know, which means a waltz played in the key of C. And he said that he learned it off of WDAY down in Fargo. But he learned it off the radio. And he said it was common, it was a common tune played across the upper Midwest at house parties. The old C waltz. And that's how he learned it. And uh, when I met him, he was in his early 80s. And that was 30 some years ago. Anyway, the old sea waltz. <laughs> A couple more fine tunes by North Arkansas fiddler extraordinaire and banjo maker, Banjo Billy Matthews. We heard the South Callaway Waltz and the Old Sea Waltz, a couple of beauties. Emily, tell me a little bit about how you transcribe these tunes. I know you listen to his recording and then you write it down. Does that take a while? 
It takes a little while. Yeah, it certainly got faster after doing it a couple hundred times. So I would <laughs> use a, I would use a computer program to transcribe each tune. Uh, I would, you know, listen to, to the first half of it and write it down, listen to the second half, write that down. And then I would play them all for Billy and he would correct it. Uh, so I would play through the tune and he would say, no, you got this note in the second half just a little bit wrong. It ought to be this one. And I would go back and edit it. And then uh, we also went through, and Billy played guitar along with all of them, and we wrote down all of the chords that he wanted to be included That's on this as well. That's a good thing to put on there, like the guitar chords. That helps a lot. Let's listen to a couple more tunes. What do you got for us now? We've got the Innkeeper and the Jubilee Hornpipe as a medley coming up next, and these are two tunes that are actually new old-time tunes. So these are tunes that Billy wrote himself, and they're actually some of my favorite tunes to play as well, played in an old-time style. And then we'll also have Waltzing Through the Leaves. Okay, let's have a listen.
Some more fine tunes by Banjo Billy Matthews. In that set, we heard The Innkeeper and The Jubilee Hornpipe, which is one of my favorite tunes. Another tune called Waltzing Through the Leaves. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we're going to visit with our friend Brooks Blevins, who will have a little bit of information for us about the gradual disappearance of the Ozark dialect. You're listening to Ozark Highlands Radio. Welcome back to Ozark Highlands Radio. Our friend Brooks Blevins is a historian, folklorist, college teacher, and an author. And he's been studying a lot lately about the Ozark dialect and the changes that have taken place over the years. So let's hear what Brooks has to say about it. In 1993, I had a summer job here at the Ozark Folk Center as an oral historian, traveling around the hills of Arkansas, interviewing folks about their experiences in the old days was one of the highlights of my life. All the Ozarkers who shared their stories with me are gone now, but I still remember many of those faces and voices as if it were yesterday. One of my favorite interviewees that summer was Dr. Audrey Thompson, a 70-something retired educator living in Sharp County, Arkansas. Dr. Thompson was the only one of my subjects who came straight to the interview from a tennis court. He may have been highly educated and thoroughly modernized, but Audrey Thompson was a genuine Ozarker, born on a farm in the tiny community of Saddle, Arkansas, just after the First World War. My most vivid memory of that interview with Dr. Thompson was something he told me that has taken me years to truly understand. He was worried that what he called the hillbilly language was disappearing, I can speak hillbilly, Dr. Thompson said, but I don't know anybody else that can, and I'd like to have somebody to speak it too. I was out at the county fair about 10 years ago, he said, and there was a fella speaking hillbilly, and that's just the way he talked. He didn't know any other way to talk. People's kindly looking at him a little bit askance, but I went over and talked to him, and I enjoyed it thoroughly, said Dr. Thompson, because he was talking hillbilly and didn't know he was talking hillbilly. That's the only way he can talk. For Dr. Thompson, it was like stepping back in time. I was a young graduate student back then, and I couldn't fully appreciate Dr. Thompson's elation, but I'm starting to now. If we live long enough, we all experience those gradual shifts that alter our language, the words and phrases we use, the way we use them. If you grow up on the margins of mainstream American society, be it a racial and ethnic minority or a particular rural region like the Ozarks or Appalachia, you really notice those changes. Radio, TV, the internet, schools, colleges, they all chip away at the linguistic margins, crowding us toward the center, making us all sound more and more like the anchor on the evening news. When it comes down to it, there's probably nothing more central to regional identity than language. And that's something Dr. Thompson was trying to tell me. So, in his memory, let's go back in the hills to explore regional dialect. If you're from Appalachia and maybe even the Texas Hill Country, you'll understand it's all part of that hillbilly language the good doc had a hankering for. But this is a show coming to you from the Ozarks, so let's call this the first of a four-parter on how to talk Ozark. Here in the Ozarks, and you can say this about almost anything that has to do with the region, the study of Ozark language starts with Vance Randolph. The folklorist published his first writings on unusual words in the Ozarks in the 1920s, just a few years after he moved here from his native Kansas. In 1953, he published the book Down in the Holler, a gallery of Ozark folk speech. But Randolph was no trained linguistics expert. He was more interested in preserving archaic words and unusual pronunciations than in tracing them to their old world or new world origins. 
The word list from down in the holler, 80 pages of terms and phrases that most living old-timers in the Ozarks don't even remember here in the 21st century, is an absolute treasure. But for deep research into the vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation of hill folks, you can't do any better than the work of the late Michael B. Montgomery, a native East Tennessean and longtime linguist at the University of South Carolina. His Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English is the most comprehensive work of its kind and the best source for understanding the language roots for us cousins over here in the Ozarks. One of the most important things Montgomery did was clear up some old misconceptions about the speech of Appalachians and Ozarkers, especially that tired old chestnut claiming our language was Elizabethan, that the dialect holds the speech patterns of the earliest English colonists preserved by the isolating mountains and hills of places like eastern Kentucky and northern Arkansas. So if some feller says something about you talking Elizabethan or speaking like Shakespeare, don't pay him no never mind. If there was any primary European influence on our dialect, Montgomery argued, it came from Northern Ireland on the boats that transported tens of thousands of the so-called Scots-Irish to colonial America. But even that can be misleading. The truth of the matter is that most of the characteristics of Appalachian and Ozark speech considered distinctive were actually developed on this side of the Atlantic. They're adaptations to life here in North America that have been best preserved among the hill folks. We'll continue talking Ozark next time, but one more thing before I go. We've all suffered through some terrible hill country accents courtesy of Hollywood. Loved the Waltons, but the accents were embarrassing. We could go on for days with the bad ones, but how about some good ones? In the modern day, two come to mind. Actress Dale Dickey is the stewed rosin in anything, and Billy Bob Thornton is Carl Childers in Sling Blade. Hands down, the best Upland South accent for a lead character on screen, big or small, even if Carl's speech owed something to the fact that he was a little slow. Old Uncle John J. Ballantyne wasn't slow in the sense of being touched, but his speech could be a mite leisurely. Here's some Ozark talk from an old-timer born just two years after the Civil War ended. Mr. Ballantyne tops off the testimony to his own fecundity with an unusual display on the quills. It was recorded by John Quincy Wolfe Jr. at 56 Arkansas in 1953, courtesy of the John Quincy Wolfe Folklore Collection at Lyon College. This your John Ballantyne, J.J. Ballantyne. He's been married three times. He's got 16 children, 88 grandchildren, 125, I believe it is, great-grandchildren. And I've got 15 of the fourth generation great-great-grandchildren. That's how old you are. 86 years old I am. Thanks, Brooks. We're, of course, visiting this week with Emily Lawless about our friend Banjo Billy Matthews, the man who knows probably more tunes than anybody anywhere, I suppose. Uh, what's this next tune going to be? This is going to be the Lone Star Rag. This is going to be one you learned from Clark Buehling out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Let's hear. Uh, I used to play a lot of dances, contra dances, square dances, some of each. Some Anyway, I played like 235 dances. That's by my count. And that's three hours at a time. So times, that that's a lot of fiddling. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't play dances anymore. Um, but it goes on. And the, and the odd thing about it is it goes on in major cities all across the country. And you go look for it out in the woods somewhere, and they haven't had a dance in 20 years. But you go to a big, huge town like Cincinnati or or uh, Louisville or some, and they got dances two or three times a week. And who would have thought that they, that they took their rural traditions and took them to the city when they moved there? It's good to see that it actually still goes on with lots of people dancing and lots of fiddlers fiddling. So I'm happy to be one of them. Anyway, the more fiddling, the better. It's one of America's actually greatest traditions, one of the greatest traditions that identifies who we are as people. And that's why we do it. Okay, the Lone Star Rag, another tune from Texas, I guess. Not too fast. Uh.
Thank you. I got Give a big hand for Billy Matthews and the old time. Players. One more tune by banjo Billy Matthews, the Lone Star Rag. You know, Emily, I know that you're a fine fiddle player, former Arkansas State champion, old time champion, and uh, that you know a lot of tunes yourself as well as Billy's tunes. Um, and uh, you have been in a great band called the Lazy Goat String Band. Uh, you and uh, who else is in that band? Believe it or not, I actually met my band members at one of Billy's workshops. So Scott Blake and his son Samuel Blake uh, played together with me in the yeah. Lazy Goat String Band. Yeah, Scott plays guitar and... and uh, Samuel's a fine banjo player. Samuel's a fine banjo player. Uh, let's hear a little bit from the Lazy Goat String Band. One of your favorite tunes that I like is Jack of Diamonds. Can we hear that one? You bet.
Wow, that was the Lazy Goat String Band. What fine fiddle, and that's a great tune. You played Jack of Diamonds, and then you also ended up with one of my favorite tunes, John Brown's Dream. Nice job. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, great tune. Thank you so much for coming this week and visiting with us about Banjo Billy Matthews, and uh, hope to see you some more, Emily. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks to all you folks for listening to our show this week. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Be sure and come back next week for more good music from Ozark Highlands Radio. This is Dave Smith, your host. I'll see you next week. Ozark Highlands Radio is produced by Jeff Glover. Executive producer is Darren Dorton. Additional support for this program comes from Arkansas State Parks, a division of the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism, with 52 unique reasons to visit the natural state. On the web at ArkansasStateParks.com. The Committee of 100 proudly supporting the Ozark Folk Center State Park since 1974 and by Stone Bank with roots in Mountain View, Arkansas. Stone Bank is a proud supporter of heritage musicians and small towns across America with government guaranteed loans for farmers, entrepreneurs, and communities. More information available at StoneBank.com. For information on upcoming shows and events, we are on the web at OzarkHighlandsRadio.com. Until next time, I'm Donna Farrar.